final discussion of what we're doing now. So you can see we're a pretty big company. We service 190 lives. We, from a mission standpoint, I've sort of articulated, our mission is quite simple. It's all about making people live healthier lives and making the healthcare system work better. Our values are extremely important to us. Our values around integrity and that we meet our commitments. Our values around performance and that we do what we say we're gonna do. Our values around relationships is around trust and collaboration. And of course, compassion, that we actually walk in the shoes of the people that we serve. And performance is all about being excellent at everything that we do. So when you think about our business, our business is all about relationships. We service four out of five providers, uh, uh, four out of five US hospitals. Uh, out of the Fortune 100 companies, four out of five we do business with. We have approximately 300 health plans, 34 government institutions, 100 plus life sciences companies. At the heart of what we do, just five capabilities that you see listed here. These five capabilities really summarize who we are. At the heart of those capabilities is data and analytics. Those two go hand in hand. We have a lot of data. It's dynamic and it's deep. But around that, we have pharmacy services, we have healthcare uh, operations, population management, uh, and healthcare delivery. We introduced about a year ago something called OptimIQ. And the reason we introduced OptimIQ is because OptimIQ powers everything that I've just discussed. And what OptimIQ is about, as you can sort of suggest from its words, is all about intelligence. It's about using artificial intelligence. And I'm going to be very specific. In our context, that means neural networks. That means to continue to do the work we've done around machine learning. But it really means to use artificial intelligence to meet the mission that we have around making the healthcare system work better and helping people live healthier lives. So OptumIQ really does define who we are as a services, a health services company. And when we talk about performance as one of our value, our performance and innovation is a value. Innovation for us means that we will invent the future and we will learn from the past. So when we talk about powering intelligence across the healthcare system, it includes all the things you see here. But our innovation, which I want to spend some time with, is very focused, very purposeful. And we'll talk about that in a moment. We talk about making the health system work better. What does that mean? It means to create a positive customer experience. It means that when people search for benefits, they walk away not only getting the answer, but having a very positive experience. When we talk about making people's lives healthier, we're talking about providing information at the right time, at the right place. Whether someone has diabetes, be able to maybe help and intervene before they actually get diabetes in terms of pharmacy care services. One of the big issues in this nation is opioid addiction. Wouldn't it be good if we could actually predict when people might get addicted and actually take corrective steps before that addiction occurs? We, we know some of this through data, pharmacy data being one example, clinical data being something that we can combine that with. So population health management is, is awesome because it helps us understand trends, but more importantly, it helps us focus on individuals in terms of making them live healthier lives. So advancing healthcare delivery, uh, again, all of this is powered by OptumIQ, uh, what we do from an operations standpoint, the fact that we have nurses and doctors who actually make in-home visits, all of this is powered by OptumIQ. So let's take a look at a quick video. <coughs> colleagues in the back are going to launch a video in a moment. <laughs>
video, you saw the intersection of IoT with AI. You saw wearables, you saw many mirrors, and this is the sort of concept about admitting the future. So let's go a little bit deeper and see what we mean by that. So to start off, uh, let's talk a little bit about artificial intelligence in terms of, of what it means to us. And we see artificial intelligence as a field of study, much like physics as a field of study. And when you think about physics as a field of study, you have things like calculus, which is a tool or method of that field of study. In a very similar way, so is machine learning, and so is deep learning to artificial intelligence. Think about Marvin Minsky for a moment. Marvin Minsky is credited, properly so, with sort of the father of AI. And when you think about Marvin Minsky, when he coined that term back in the 50s, I think it was, or whenever that time period was, he really did see AI much like we talk about it today. This ability to not just have smart algorithms, but really machines doing things better than humans. But there was another guy who appeared on the scene at the same time, who you may not have or be as familiar with, a guy named Carl Glitter. And I don't know if that name is familiar to you, but he was also a pretty profound computer scientist. And he had a different vision, not as sexy as Marvin's vision. And his vision was around intelligent amplification. So when we look at these two visions, you could argue, you could assert that one is more about strong AI and the other is more like weak AI. But you could put them under the same umbrella. But I, I have that conversation with you because I think it's important if we want to be really clear about how we advance this field, how we actually make people lives healthier, that we actually understand what we are trying to do with technology with artificial intelligence. So let me give another story. In 1997, in 1997, Gary Kasparov, a grand chess master, Russian, you may recall, went up against a computer, IBM's Deep Blue, and he lost. And for many people, that was a signal that machines have come of age, that machines have finally arrived and can do things better than people can. But there's another story that hasn't been told as widely, which is that Gary Kasparov didn't end his participation, participation in chess in 1997. He went on to form a, another kind of chess competition called Centaur Chess. And you know the story of a centaur, half horse, half human, sort of a play on machine and man. In 2005, there was a tournament, a Centaur tournament. And what was interesting about this tournament, and, and the way Centaur Chess works, is that everyone can come and play. You can be a grandmaster or a non-grandmaster. You can bring your own computer. It can be a supercomputer. It can be a handheld computer, whatever you want. But the point is, you come and play chess and bring your computer. What's interesting about that 2005 competition is that a grandmaster entered the competition with a supercomputer. And two other guys, they're pretty good chess players, but they were not grandmasters. They also entered the competition. And they didn't have a supercomputer, but they did have a computer. But more importantly, they won. They beat the grandmaster with a supercomputer. So what did we learn from that? What we learned from that is that intelligent amplification is actually quite powerful, that the cooperation between man and machine is actually significant. And all the stories that are now next articulate about what we're doing at Optum with artificial intelligence really have a lot to do with the cooperation between man and machine. And the reason for that is because I would assert that when we look at artificial intelligence and when we, and when we look today at what computers do really well, and, and by the way, much better than we do as a species, 
is computational task. Whether that's vision, whether that's hearing, whether that's searching through documents, whether that's crunching numbers, or in fact just playing chess. But when you add a human into that equation with the machine, and I think Centaur Chess proves that as one data point, we have an even more powerful outcome. And that's what we're, uh, that's what we're working on. So this next slide I wanted to share with you. We've got a lot of good data scientists at Optum. It is a specialty that we had for decades. It's what, it's what powers our insights. We've evolved our data scientists into what I'm describing as these modern data scientists. For the most part, our data scientists are distinguishable from our AI software engineers. What do they have in common? What they have in common is that in both cases, they're knowledgeable of machine learning algorithms. They are fluent in the adoption and use of neural networks and all of the latest machine learning and machine learning frameworks. So that's what they have in common. Where they start to diverge is that our data scientists really are domain specific. They're problem solvers. They're not really computer scientists. They don't actually build cloud services. They don't build microservices. They don't build APIs. But they do build very advanced, very rich models. They have a strong mathematical background. They are very well schooled in computer fundamentals. But they are data scientists extraordinary. And from a modern standpoint, we pair our data scientists increasingly with software engineers to create a certain outcome, to actually have models that work in real time. And when I say models, I'm talking about models generated from deep learning exercises. We also have recognized that acquiring data scientists is a challenge. So we actually have a data science university where we actually work with universities like Carnegie Mellon, the University of Minnesota, and others. And we are actually growing data scientists. And we find some extraordinary talent at the university level that has been really, really outstanding. We have other things that we're doing in terms of a focus on making our models more real time. And so we take our models and we're doing work to create what we describe as microservices catalogs to actually uh, reflect the instantiation of those algorithms so that they can be invoked in real time through APIs. So we have a strong focus on data science. It uh, continues to be a core skill of what we do. So just as a bit of a backdrop, we are an organization, we are a company, as I mentioned, who has done analytics and continue to do analytics and, and I mean analytics in its very pure form its ability to make predictions we're also an organization that for a number of years has been very active in machine learning and we've been able to demonstrate very very clearly that we get better results with machine learning than we get over our previous conventional techniques with analytics so that superiority in, in results and examples here is with diabetes. Clearly a big problem across the world, a big problem in the US. What this is showing you is that the accuracy of predicting who might get diabetes, we're able to do that better with a machine learning model than we were with a previous linear, linear regression model with just plain analytics. So the difference, of course, being that they both have that in common. But the difference is that the machine learning model is based on raw data, uh, both supervised and unsupervised. The other big difference is that makes the result so much more powerful is that the number of markers, the number of indicators, the number of features to indicate that a person has diabetes, if we were simply doing this as a man-made, process analytics. The result is that we got a lot of good markers. And in this example, you see 28. But when we adopted machine learning, that increased to 290. That means we have a much more accuracy. When you look at population health, and you're looking at millions of people, 
it's important, it matters that you're predicting and intervening at the right time for the right person at the right moment. We haven't done this yet, but we're pretty confident that when we start applying neural networks to these same problems, and we, uh, I should say we haven't done it, we actually have done it, we're going to see even more markers get introduced, uh, some that we didn't even anticipate. So we are also applying this in opioid abuse. Again, if it's not clear, our ability to have our care representatives be able to make a phone call, be able to communicate to patients in a way that matters, in a way that makes sense, that we think that you should maybe take this course of action versus this course of action, and as a result of doing so, you won't get addicted to opioids. That's a pretty powerful outcome in terms of making and helping people live healthier lives. So aside from the more obvious things that we're doing with machine learning, because we're using it to make better recommendations, next best actions, um, but a lot of it is about predictions. So deep learning, deep learning is something that is relatively new to us over the last 12 months. We've been working with NVIDIA. Uh, we had the great pleasure of having NVIDIA spend an, just an enormous amount of time with us on building models. And we've been doing uh, you know, feature learning, representation learning. Uh, but the, the, the real benefit for deep learning for us is it's really a different analytical model. It's something that allows us to eliminate or reduce a substantial amount of feature engineering, which by the way, when you think about how much time that consumes, it's enormous. So think about trying to take a population uh, who may have attention deficit disorder, may have depression, may have opioid uh, addiction, may have diabetes. Before deep learning, what we had to do is we had to model those one at a time. When you think about the whole life cycle, we're talking months that it would take. And now, with deep learning, we can do all of those multi-models, and we're no longer in this uniting model world. We can do all of these models at the same time. The benefits to our community that we serve, the patients that we serve, is enormous. Uh, because it allows us to do predictions, it allows us to do intervention, it allows us to do strategies that we didn't do before. So with deep learning, we're also able to take SMEs and repurpose them. We don't have to have as many subject matter experts, doctors, nurses, helping us with each of the We can actually take the raw data and have the neural network generate some of these features. Now this comes with a cost because, and this is where explainable AI is important, because explainable AI means that we actually have to spend the time to have testable artificial intelligence so that we actually understand why the neural network produced these markers and not these markers. We have to have that awareness because we have to be able to have a conversation with doctors and other clinical practitioners of why these outcomes. It can't be a black box. So when we look at the areas that we're focused on, uh, we've talked about these before, but it's around operations and pharmacy. All of these are important. How do we pick what use cases to work on? First and foremost, it's all about value. Can we make the system work better? Can we make people's lives healthier? That's the value proposition. How much data do we have? Do we have enough, enough data to actually make a difference here? Is it the gold standard in terms of how we would actually train our models? And we've got to look at the regulatory environment as possible constraint. So when you look at deep learning and what we're doing, it's if we can reduce the amount of time that a patient goes to an emergency room, that can result in a life save. If we can reduce the amount of time that it takes to get uh, your authorization for health benefits, if we can adjudicate that, if we can automate that rather, patients, everyone will be happier. If we can save time, if we can eliminate your out-of-network usage, it's going to save everyone money. If we can auto-adjudicate, again, it makes for a happier uh, system. And of course, if we can eliminate fraud, it means that the system works better as well. 
So in terms of uh, other use cases for deep learning, uh, we're looking at, uh, not just looking at it, we have this stuff running in pilots at the day. We have uh, uses of, of things like Alexa to help patients, remind them to take their medications. We're looking at uh, uh, um, uh, augmentation, uh, uh, video, uh, virtual reality to, uh, to help people with uh, phobias. We're looking at uh, uh, being able to use your voice to, over time, maybe begin to see patterns that suggest that maybe Alzheimer's might be uh, an onset. So these are the kinds of things. We're looking for best fit problems. Uh, data, of course, is key. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, things going on with deep learning. And again, I've talked about this already, but the real difference for us is around the time savings of reducing the amount of time that we spend in feature engineering. We're also doing a lot of work in natural language processing. Uh, this has an enormous opportunity to make chatbots work better, an enormous opportunity to enable our customer service representatives to have automated bots to, uh, to make this work better as well. And, and this is a typical problem. You know, our members uh, are being asked questions in some cases. This is being a classic example that the patient is saying, hey, can you tell me if ABA services are covered and, and our person doesn't know what an ABA service is. Uh, this is applied behavioral analysis, but it's pretty common for the patient to know this. And uh, with natural language processing, we can fix that. So virtual assistants are also a big part of what we're doing. So with that, uh, thank you.